Hey friends, Dr. Randy Lane Butcher, pastor of Connecting Point Church and the founder of Connecting Point Communications. We're delighted you've tuned into the broadcast today and we believe we have a powerful message that's going to be a great blessing to you. In fact, I think we're going to talk about one of the important keys to not only helping us grow spiritually and mature in our faith individually, but also to be effective corporately as the Church of Jesus Christ. Before we get to the message, though, I want to remind you, as always, of the resources we have free and available for you at randylanebudge.org. Under the media link, you will find a plethora of resources free and available to you. Our blog, our podcast, our magazine, past editions of our television broadcast, on and on it goes. So many resources that will be a blessing to you at randylanebunch.org right under that media link. If you would go to our YouTube channel that you can find there, we would appreciate it too. If you would subscribe, like, and comment, that would be a great blessing to us. In addition to that, we would love it if you would email us at info at connectingpc.org. We would love to hear your praise reports and testimonies, how the broadcast is affecting your life. We would really love to hear from that. In addition to that, we'd love to stand in faith with you. So please feel free to share with us any prayer requests that you have. Well, as I said, we're going to be sharing today something that I think is a real key to our own growth in the Lord, as well as our effectiveness corporately as the Church of Jesus Christ. I'm simply talking about the value of our connections with one another. I want to begin reading in Acts chapter 2 with verse 42. And we're going to look at verses 42 through about 46 or 47. It says here, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all the believers were together and had all things in common. And they would sell their property and possessions and share them with all to the extent that anyone had need. Day by day, continuing with one mind at the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. You know, I have heard this again and again, and you probably have too. I've heard people level criticisms at a given church and say, well, that church down the street, they're nothing but a social club. <laughs> And I understand what the criticism is meant to imply. What they feel like was that they're just always having a good time, potlucks, and you know the kids are in plays, and they're doing productions and that kind of thing, and just spending a lot of time fellowshipping with one another, rather than getting down to the real business of preaching the Word of God and evangelizing and making disciples. But friend, I would contend that particularly in our day where there's so much skepticism against not only biblical Christianity, but the church in general, that maybe one of the best places where we can help to integrate the Word of God into the lives of people, evangelize and make disciples, is in a social context. In other words, you're probably going to have a better opportunity to share your faith with your friends, make disciples, and talk about the things of God over a cup of coffee at a Starbucks than you are asking them to come to your church where they've never been to hear an evangelist whom they don't know. So oftentimes, I think we mistake the opportunity of social events, of social occasions that can be greatly used and taken advantage of to witness and share our faith and also grow closer bonds as believers together. Rather than seeing it as a negative, I think we should see it as a positive. Another thing that kind of amuses me about this is that many people who will criticize a church for being a social club are the same people that will walk away from a different church and say, that church just simply isn't friendly enough. What's the criticism there? Well, they're just not sociable enough. <laughs> so I think we need a social context. I think that's what church is. I think for so long we've had conventions and we've had seminars and we don't even know anymore what the local church is to be. We're conference rich, but we're connection poor. And friend, the local church is not a conference. It's not a seminar. It might hold some of those, but that's not what it is. The church is a family. And if the church is going to be anything, it ought to be social. And you know, when I have people come to my church or if I'm going to another church, I want to find that it's a social church. I want to be welcomed. I want to feel warm. I love the verse of scripture in uh, Psalm 68 verse 6 where the Bible said, God sets the lonely in families. And we need people to feel that they're a part of our family. We need to be sociable. And again and again, I found this to be such a strength in my own life as I've had the opportunity to invest into people and they've invested into my life as well. You know, I have a lot of friends that are invested in what we would call power evangelism. They go to a particular nation and they preach to the masses. And of course, they'll see miracles take place as God confirms the word through the signs that follow. Uh, they'll have follow-up, of course, and make sure that their teams are making sure these people understand the commitment they've made to Christ. Uh, and you know, we believe very much in the power of the Holy Spirit, demonstrations of power. We see Acts chapter 2, uh, 3,000 souls come to save. Acts chapter uh, 3, where 5,000 souls come to be saved. And we say, that's what we like, man. We like a demonstration. 
of the power of God and the harvest to be reaped. And I concur 100%. I wholeheartedly believe in that. I've spent much of my ministry preaching and teaching about the power of God, seeing the power of God come into demonstration, and seeing souls uh, get saved. But then I think we have to ask an important question. Then what? We've had the great harvest. We've had the souls saved. We've seen demonstration of the power of God. Now what? I'll tell you what now. Exactly what we read. Because verse 42 begins talking about what the church did immediately after the day of Pentecost. When 3,000 souls were saved, what did they do? They begin to create community. Because, friend, we have to have a growth environment where once people are saved, they can begin to fellowship with other people, hear the Word of God, begin to create relationships with others who will inspire and, in, and fire them up, and continue to help them grow in their faith and walk with God. I like what Smith Wigglesworth said. The church needs not only to be concerned with the new birth, but the newborn as well. And it's great to have harvest. It's great to have signs, wonders, and miracles, and see people come to Christ in, in, in large numbers. But at the same time, I think we have to ask ourselves, okay, then what? What do we do with these people that have been born again? I'll tell you what we do. We get them in community. We get them at a local church. I was talking with a friend of mine the other day, and some of these thoughts came out of uh, an article that I'd written called The Social Club. You can find it on our website at randylanebunch.org in my blog. And uh, I talk about some of these issues. But then I was talking also with a friend of mine, and we were talking about what is it that really makes a believer dynamic. If I look back over my young spiritual life, and I was raised in a different context, a different denominational context than what I am now. I'm in, you know, full gospel guy, I believe in the power, demonstration of the Spirit of God, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, all that good stuff. I was raised in a different kind of context, more of a denominational context, but still a very wholesome and healthy church environment. And if I look back, I have to be honest with you, and this is hard for me to say as a career preacher, but I would, I would struggle to think of even one or two messages that I can remember from my childhood. And we preached the gospel. Of course, a lot of the people in the denomination that I was a part of, they were just a lot of frustrated evangelists preaching salvation to people that were already saved. And so we didn't have maybe as much follow-up and discipleship about you know, other things in the Word of God as might have been uh, good to have. But at the same time, if I look back at what made my young spiritual life dynamic, what helped to bring me to the place where I'm at today, I would 100% say that it was my connections. I can't remember a lot of sermons, but I can sure remember a lot of relationships. I can remember the church that I grew up in. It was such a wholesome environment, that Southern Baptist church where people loved one another. And if a fellow in our church had to have a, a new driveway poured, if he had to have the concrete poured, he didn't call a contractor. He called the other men, men of the church. And somebody would get a cement mixer from somebody and maybe they'd rent one from the local True Value or something like that if they had such a thing back in my childhood years. I don't remember where we got them then, but they would bring that and the men of the church would get together and help that man pour his driveway and they would, you know, uh, pave it over and make it look just so. And when we needed to put an addition on the local church, again, we didn't call contractors. The guys of the church got together and they did it. And the women would cook meals for them while they worked. And they would assist in the work too. And I remember as a little kid going down to the church with my dad and helping put a new wing on the church building as it were. And so they did life together. I, I remember wonderful um, experiences in my life after a Sunday evening service where I would tell my mom, hey, invite the Carols over. And the Carols were another family in our church. They didn't have any kids my age. I have one of their sons as one of my dear friends today, but he was you know, much older than me at that time. I was just a little kid. He was 11 years older than me. We didn't have anything much to do with each other then. But I just liked the house filled with the conversation of friends of ours from the church. And they would talk about everything from football to, you know, sports to politics to everything you can imagine. It wasn't just about the things of God, but it was in that sanctified environment of Christian fellowship. And even when I would go to bed at night, I could hear them talking in the next room, and I, I loved it. My mom always had a pot of coffee on because, you know, that's the sanctified Christian beverage. Everybody has to have that to go to heaven. Uh, I'm being facetious, but nevertheless, we always had a pot of coffee on. And my mom, I always joke about the cheap cookies my mom would buy. They would be some, like a poor man's Oreo with either a vanilla or a chocolate outside and some kind of toxic fluid on the inside that, that, that um, you know, served as cream filling. And, uh, you know, you could buy 500 for a buck. And so we would have these cheap cookies and a cup of coffee and the men would talk and the ladies would talk and you would hear the voices of the people that you loved in the next room. It was a beautiful way to grow up in that community, potlucks and revivals. And, and it was just a wonderful way to understand that the church was a family and that we are the church. And I think about the fact that the Bible tells us that the impact of connections on our lives 
is enormous. Let me read you a couple of verses of scripture that you probably already know that we've talked about on the broadcast before. But 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, do not be deceived. Evil co company corrupts good habits. Again, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. I like to say it this way, you, this way, you rise or fall to the level of your associations. Somebody else has said it like this, friends are like elevators, they'll take you up or down. And that's absolutely the truth. And the Bible doesn't just say this here in the New Testament, it also says the same thing to us really in the Old Testament. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, the Bible says, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. You know, I look back again at my young Christian life, and I think about the fact that God was so good to have the right people at the right time in my life to inspire and fuel the fire in my young Christian life. I remember as a, uh, I would say a late teenager, probably around 18, 19 years of age, maybe somewhere around that, I don't remember exactly, but I, I remembered it was time for me to buy my first Bible. Now, I was raised in church, friend, I had Bibles all my life, but I hadn't bought my own Bible. And there was only one Christian bookstore in our little town, there's none now, but there was a little Christian bookstore at the time uh, uh, that was owned and operated by a lady by the name of Sandy Jackson, who's still a good Facebook friend of mine, her son's still a good friend of mine to this day. But uh, Sandy owned the Christian bookstore down, at that time it was in, on Center Street downtown, and uh, in this same community from which I'm preaching right now. And I remember I went down there and I went in her store and introduced myself. That's when we got to know one another. And I said, I'd like to buy a Bible. I would like a New American Standard Bible. And I wanted a New American Standard simply because one of my friends had New American Standard. And I figured that was a translation to get, even though, of course, I knew the Apostle Paul used the King James. But nevertheless, I was going to go ahead and get a New American Standard. Well, she didn't have one. So I went ahead and settled for a nice leather-bound King James Bible. And that became my Bible. But as important as that Bible was, was the connection that I made with Sandy. She was a number of years older than me, so something like an older sister or a younger mother. And uh, we became very good friends. And in the process of time, her shop moved from Center Street up to B Street. And she moved into a facility right next to Jerry Leonard the barber. Jerry Leonard was a, quite a character himself. He was a man of faith. In fact, he had been on the cover of Voice Magazine, the periodical of Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International. And Jerry had a miracle ministry. Jerry would pray over everyone who came for a haircut, whether they wanted it or not. He'd be praying in the spirit under his breath as he cut their hair. And oftentimes, God would give him words of knowledge. And so there was a nice write-up about Jerry and Voice Magazine. I remember going into his shop one day after I'd visited with Sandy for a little while, and there was a man who had flown in from Alaska just to have Jerry pray the prayer of faith with him so that he could be healed. And Jerry had him listening to the Word of God on cassette tape to help build up his faith before he prayed for him. What wonderful days. I remember going and visiting with Sandy. At that time, I was uh, you know, in junior college, and I had a, a kind of a summer job uh, <laughs> as a security guard out in the oil fields. This is oil field country where I live. And so uh, I guess one of the companies had laid off a bunch of men, and so they were concerned about some vandalism. So they hired the security company that I worked for to guard some sea trains out in the oil fields because, you know, everybody wants to steal a sea train, I guess. But nevertheless, that was my job. And I requested a graveyard ship because I wanted, I had my Walkman back in those days. Some of you remember a Walkman, it was a cassette player, and my headphones, and I would listen to Bible teaching tapes eight hours a night. I'd be driving my little truck from sea train to sea train, checking up you know, every hour, all the places I was supposed to check off that I had been to and guarded. But while I was doing that, I was listening to the Word of God on tape. And man, I'm telling you, I got so full of the Word of God. Uh, when my shift ended at 7 in the morning, there was no way I was going to go to sleep. Uh, Sandy opened up her Bible bookstore relatively early in the morning. So once I got home and kind of freshened myself up, maybe had a bite to eat, I went up to the Christian bookstore. And ever so often while I'd be sharing with her all the wonderful things I was learning, her fueling my faith, me fueling her faith, getting excited about the things of God, some hapless housewife would make the mistake of coming in the store and asking a Bible question. And before I'd known what I'd done, I had her and her friends backed into a corner preaching the Word of God to them. I'm still wearing my little security guard outfit, but I'm preaching the Word of God out of man. And uh, finally, I would, you know, have expended myself and finally begin to feel fatigued from my working all through the night. And I'd go home to get my nap. And these ladies sometimes would come up to Sandy and say, where does he pastor? I want to go to his church. I didn't have any church. I had the church out in the wilderness guarding the sea trains in the graveyard shift as I was listening to the Word of God. But those were wonderful days of talking with Sandy and talking with uh, Jerry and then my pastor at the time, Buddy Holbrook, those Southern Baptists, 
was a closet tongue talker too. And uh, he encouraged me in the things of God. What wonderful days those were. I mentioned the Carroll family earlier, their younger son, or their, their older son, I should say, older than me by about 11 years, but um, they had a, a son and a daughter, but their son uh, traveled overseas and worked for Eastern European Bible Mission, smuggling Bibles behind the Iron Curtain back in the early 80s. And I remember thinking, how cool is that? You know, as I began to get on fire for God, I knew that he was over there smuggling Bibles. And, and I thought, you know, that would be just the kind of relationship I need to fuel my fire. And so I prayed and I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, when Larry comes back, off this two-year, you know, stint of serving, smuggling Bibles. I just pray that you would cause us to become good friends. And when he came back, we did. We became good friends, and he showed me all of his slides from Eastern Europe, and I made him show me those slides again and again. You could see the, you know, all the hammer and sickle emblems in these nations where he had smuggled Bibles, and he would tell me his stories uh, of, you know, dodging the secret police and getting uh, biblical materials into the hands of those persecuted Christians behind the Iron Curtain. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. It's like James Bond for Jesus, you know? And I would just get so excited to hear those same stories again and again and again. But these wonderful relationships, I think about the couple, Jim and Margie Harmer, that prayed for me when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, a young Baptist so hungry for God I didn't know what to do. And I remember the night that I went to their house. Jim was in the same gospel quartet I was. He was the drummer, I was a baritone singer. And Jim and Margie prayed for me, and I will never forget when she squeezed my hand. I'm holding his hand on one side, her hand on the other, and she squeezed my hand and said, be filled with the Spirit. And I felt something like an electric shock go through me, and sure enough, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I spake with other tongues. And I could go on and on and talk about these wonderful relationships that God brought into my life that really caused me to be stirred up and on fire for God. And I think that we've lost something. Again, we're conference rich, but connection poor. It's these personal relationships. It wasn't necessarily the pastor in the pulpit or the messages I was hearing at the church I was attending. I wasn't getting that much out of that, but I was sure getting a lot out of these relationships of other people that were on fire for God and that helped to fuel my fire and speak into my life in those days. And like I said, the church that I grew up in was a church that had mastered something that's lost today. And in fact, when I was talking to my friend the other day and we were kind of stirring one another up about some of these issues, he asked me, he said, you know, because we were talking about ministry and I've been in the traveling ministry as well as pioneered and pastored churches. And I was talking about the importance of, you know, a traveling guy having some kind of niche, something, some niche that he has, something he specializes in, something he brings to that church that is exceptional, that maybe is a little bit different than what the pastor brings. Otherwise, the pastor doesn't need to bring him in. He can just do it himself. So as we were talking about that, he was asking me a question. He said, Randy, what do you think it is that the church is missing today that is a vital component? And without hesitation, I said, hospitality. See, we do everything at the church. We have the big media productions. We have the you know smoke and mirrors and the lights and all that kind of thing. But people want connection, friend. And particularly after this COVID pandemic and the isolation we've all felt, what people genuinely want is authentic connection with people. You know, I'm, I, I love the fact that Jesus loves me, but sometimes we need Jesus with skin on. We need Jesus wrapped in warm human flesh that can give us a hug and embrace us and welcome us over to their home. And, you know, that's what the Bible said that they were doing. They were having their meals together. They were, the church was together. They were going from house to house. And yes, they were involved in the apostles' doctrine and the breaking of bread. But also the Bible said that they prayed together. They had their meals together. And they fellowshiped together. And these components are just as integral as all the rest of it. In fact, I think it's interesting over here in Romans chapter 12. Let me read you verses 9 through uh, 13 here. It says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. See, right along with persevering in persecution, right along with prayer, right along with a hypocritical love demonstrated with authenticity to one another, he says, also, you need to be given to hospitality. Invite those folk over to your house. You know, we get somebody new to the church and maybe they feel like they've made a connection, maybe not. But what if all of a sudden, after the service is over, before they can get out the door, someone comes up to them and says, you know what, I, I noticed you're new here today. My wife and I are going down to the Chili's restaurant down the street. Why don't you come with us? We'd love to get to know you. I, I think some people wouldn't even know what to do with something like that because we've lost the art of hospitality. You know, I guess growing up in a Southern home, even though I was born and raised in California, all my family's from the South, and man, they knew how to have dinner. And every Sunday, my mom after church would make a roast, 
And uh, we didn't want to eat that roast by ourselves. It was more than we could eat. And so anybody that we could find would come to the house with us. And particularly when I was in junior college, we had several people from out of state that were going to the junior college, maybe involved with sports, playing football, and we befriended some of those people. And so they would come over uh, as Sunday guests. And some of these folk were from the South and they hadn't had a good home cooked meal in a while. And my family's all from the South, man. I didn't even know what soul food was for the longest time. I thought that's just food. You know, black eyed peas, cornbread, uh, chicken fried steak. And I thought gravy was its own food group growing up, friend. And so, you know, all this wonderful food and we knew how to set the table. And, and we had wonderful opportunities of fellowship like this that made people have a sense of belonging. I want to close with this story and then I'm going to come back and talk about this next week as well because I just think it's such an important element that we've lost in the church. But I remember when I was pastoring in New England, Thanksgiving was coming and I, I began looking around the church and I, I, I began to notice there, there were a number of people that were going to UVM, University of Vermont, or that were just maybe single people or that weren't going to be able to get home with their families. And I, I had an idea. So I ran it by my family to see what they thought about it. And I said, what would it be like if instead of having our Thanksgiving at home, and watching football like I like to do, uh, what if we were to bring our Thanksgiving meal to the church and just kind of open the table, as it were, to these people that don't have an opportunity to get home at Thanksgiving? Everybody loved the idea. I tell you, it was a sacrifice on my part, I'll be honest with you, because I love enjoying you know, a quiet Thanksgiving with my family and then watching football, but I thought this is the right thing to do. And so we let some of the people know and it generated way more excitement than what I anticipated. And so, of course, that single young girl from college, I remember, and then an older gentleman, in fact, he had even sent me a phone message and told me how lonely he was in the holidays. And then when we had this idea, he was so thrilled that he wouldn't be alone for Thanksgiving. And so we had a good number join us there. I don't remember exactly, maybe a dozen people, uh, maybe a little less that joined us for the meal. But what I didn't anticipate was there were so many people in our church that had family obligations that wanted to be with the church family more than they wanted to be with their flesh and blood family. After all, we're a family of like precious faith. And they knew there was going to be conflict in those family meetings and people who didn't agree with them about this or that, or maybe they're on the other spectrum politically and it was going to be contentious and these families maybe they don't always necessarily get together. And so they were bummed they couldn't come to the dinner. But you know what a lot of them did? They went and had their uh, uh, you know, obligatory meal with the family. And then they joined us for you know, pecan and pumpkin pie afterward. And then we had Bible Pictionary and some other board games. We were there for hours. And what shocked me was what a great time I had. I anticipated other people enjoying it, but I had more fun on that event. And you know, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than receive. I think I got more out of it than anybody. We did that for the next two following years. The next year, we had to double up uh, on the space. Everybody knew it was coming. And so a lot of people just made plans to be at that meal and some of them brought their families with them. And by the time we had the third year, I couldn't be there. So my family was away. So we had other people in charge of it, but they filled up two full long tables. And I'm not talking about just one table, eight feet tables, a couple in a row, two rows of that. I mean, there was so many people. It looked like the Waltons on steroids. It looked like that old Norman Rockwell painting of Thanksgiving and the holidays. And it was just beautiful, the fellowship, the connection, the sense of belonging. And friend, I'm telling you, that is what the world is hungry for. They're hungry for that sense of belonging. They're hungry for that sense of family, of connection. And friend, I think there's just another level, uh, another level we need to go to in our Christian experience. I, I love technology. Almost everything I do has to do with technology. So I'm not against the lights. I'm not against the smoke and mirrors. I'm not against any of that stuff. But I'm saying that once we've had service, once we've had the great move of God, once we've had the harvest, what are we going to do next? I'll tell you what we're going to do next. We're going to create communities. What are communities? They're growth environments where people can grow. And you know, if you create the right kind of growth environment, you know what happens? People grow and don't even know they're growing. It's absolutely true. I was thinking about it today when we were talking, this morning in the devotional, I was talking about uh, growth environments. A garden is a growth environment. What makes a, a growth environment a growth environment? Well, it's a growth environment because the seed that's planted in the garden is fertilized, it's watered, it's cared for, it's pruned. So it produces fruit in its season. You take that same seed and throw it outside of our yard. On the other side of our fence, off our property, is just tumbleweed and barren, dry, dry dirt. Not been a lot of rain around here recently. And so you throw that same seed there and it's going to probably be either devoured by the birds or it's going to simply just die not having been properly planted and tended. And what a church does, it provides a growth environment 
where people are not only planting seeds, but watering seeds and challenging one another, helping to prune back our trees at times. But we're creating an envir environment where we can grow, where we can learn from one another, and where we have that sense of belonging. What made the church of the first century so powerful? The Bible said the church was together. And friend, we need the church together today more than ever, particularly in the climate in which we find ourselves today. We need a church that's together, that's loving one another, that's caring for one another, that's distributing to the necessity of the saints and meeting the needs of people. Are you a member of the church? Oh yeah, brother, I go down to the church down the street. I've been a member of such and such church for many. No, that's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you if you're a member of God's church. See, friend, there's only one way you become a member of that cosmic family called the Church of Jesus Christ, and that is you've got to be born into it. Jesus said you must be born again. Nicodemus said, how can I be born a second time? Can I go back into my mother's womb? Jesus said, no, no, no. I'm not talking about a natural birth. Nicodemus, you need to be born of the Spirit as well. Have you been born again? You say, how do I do that? <laughs> well, Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sins on Calvary's cruel cross. He died so that the scales of divine justice could be balanced on your behalf, friend. Have you received him and what he's done for you? Have you identified with him as Lord and Savior? Have you asked him to come into your heart and take over management of your life? If you haven't, let's do that right now. Why don't you pray this simple prayer with me? Just say this. Dear Jesus, I said, say it out loud. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. But Jesus, I believe you died for me, paid the penalty for my sins. And right now, I ask you to come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I put my trust in you. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, I want to hear from you. Email me at info at connectingpc.org. I want to welcome you to the family of God, stand in faith with you. But I also want to pray for your physical needs. If you're out there today and you need a healing touch from heaven, uh, maybe you have oppression coming against your mind and you need to be set free by the power of God. I'm going to pray for you. Just get ready to receive. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my friends all over the world, wherever they are. I pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that your mighty power might be extended to them right now. Father God, I pray for chronic conditions. I pray for backs, Father God, that are out of alignment. I pray right now that they would begin to come into divine alignment. I thank you, Father God, for various symptoms, Father God, beginning to disappear and dissipate even now. Pain, discomfort, Thank you, Father God, for blind eyes seeing, for deaf ears opening. Thank you, God, for causing, we, we right now we speak against tumors. We command them to wither and die. We thank you for causing them to be made whole. We thank you, Father, for wholeness, soundness, complete and total healing from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. Father God, we speak to that one that's oppressed in mind. We take authority over the devil. We command him to loose their minds in the name of Jesus. We declare the captive to be set free now in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father God, for testimonies of healing and deliverance. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We thank you for it, Father. And I also thank, thank you, Father, I pray for financial provision. Father God, I don't know who's watching tonight that needs that or today that's watching that and that needs it, but we thank you, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus for supernatural provision, for opening the windows of heaven on their behalf. Thank you for directing them into steps of obedience whereby your provision might be made available to them. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friend, we want to encourage you again. Go to the website, randylanebunch.org. Under the media link is a plethora of resources, free and available to you. There are so many resources there that can continue to teach you and feed you on the Word of God. Let it be your surrogate community until you find a good local church. But definitely find a local church in your area. Be a part of that community that you might continue to grow in faith. I love what one of my spiritual fathers says, when you feed your faith, you starve your doubts. Just let your doubts die. Well, friends, we love you. God bless you. And we'll see you next time on Connecting Point. Mm -hmm.